morning as we sing. Pastor, good morning, Pastor. Good morning, church. Sun shining. I think we might actually be moving into a little bit of spring, huh? Uh, we've had all this cold weather and rainy weather. It's good to be with you. I just got back yesterday afternoon from a business trip to Texas, so it's good to be back home in Kentucky. There you go. Was it warmer in Texas? It was warmer in Texas. It was warmer in Texas. Listen, if you're a visitor, I'm Pastor Marsha. This is Pastor Kenny. We welcome you to Bluegrass United Church of Christ, and we really hope that the minute you walk in, you feel like you're one of us, because we certainly feel that way. So it's good to have you this morning. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, why don't we take a quick moment and turn to those who are closest to you and hug their neck or shake their hand. Let them know how delighted you are to see them this morning. I think interfaith um, work together and worship together is really a key to world peace. So many wars are fought in the name of religion and who's got the right to the idea of God and who doesn't. Tomorrow, our dear friend J.R. Zarkowski has arranged another wonderful encounter. This one's called United in Growth. It's at St. Michael Episcopal Church. Information's on the back of your bulletin. And uh, we are really trying to continue, or JR's continuing to try to keep those short so folks will enjoy them but come. And so they're going to be just an hour tomorrow. So there'll be music from 6 to 6.30, and the encounter will be from 6.30 to 7.30. Uh, one of my good friends and an amazing preacher, Reverend Laurie Brock, who is the rector there at the, of St. Michael's, is going to deliver the message. And New Song in the Bluegrass, who've come here to sing, and some of us sing in their choir, they'll be singing, and they'll be debuting a new composition I've written called Celebrate Life. So I hope you'll join us tomorrow. Uh, 
uh, at this encounter. Absolutely. And then a week from today, we're going to be gathering as a church. One of the things that we always enjoy most about being a part of a family is when the family gets together, kind of like a family get together, family yeah. cookout reunion. So we're going to be having a potluck next Sunday afternoon at four o'clock at Jacobson Park. Some of you remember, was it last summer, I guess, or last early fall mm -hmm. that we all got together at Jacobson Park and had a lot, a lot of fun, plenty of food, and we sang, and we just had a good time. So hopefully you can come and be with us next Saturday afternoon at four o'clock at Jacobson Park. Hopefully, good Lord willing, we're going to have some nice, did I say Saturday? It's Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank what you about much. our company's Brenda sitting there going, Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> It's Sunday. <laughs> I'm hearing voices and promptings from God, and she sounds angry. <laughs> So next Sunday at 4 o'clock, come and join us. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Billy uh, Metcalf, you can see him for more information, details. And, and Monica's put something on Facebook in a survey to sign up for things. And so if you'll do that and we'll grill hamburgers and hot dogs, we'll have plenty of things for vegetarians and uh, play some games, sing some songs. And who knows, we might get some of the crowd of Jacobson to come over and join us. And have Absolutely. We did last year. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, of course, Pastor, uh, we've got some exciting things going on. We really do. We announced this last week. Uh, my sign sort of got crooked, so we'll get that straightened up because you all know I'm pretty OCD. So I told Stephen before service, I said, nah, I'm going to have to focus on my sermon and not the polls that are dropping. But at any rate, here's the point of it. We have had two donors um, in our community who believe in what bluegrass is all about. And they knew that we owed about $25,000 on this building and property and including all the renovations we've done. We've renovated twice. And they came to me and said, tell you what, we will do a dollar to dollar match if you all will do a campaign and try to raise money. So if we can raise about $12,500 within our church between now and June the 10th, they're going to match that dollar for dollar. And uh, we're pretty excited about that because that would be pretty meaningful for our little church. If you didn't get one of these envelopes last week, uh, Stanley will make sure you have one or we'll get you one. Uh, but if you can be thinking about that and praying about that between now and June the 10th, uh, then we will celebrate that. It's really exciting. We've already got a great start. Belinda Cole, in memory of Peggy, gave us a check for $1,000, which is the gold brick. So every time we raise $1,000, we're going to put a gold brick up here. We're going to keep building it up. And Miss Elnora actually was just taken to the emergency room. We want to pray for her. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but Miss Elnora, who was here when Emmanuel was here for 57 years, and they had a note burning service, but the problem was it wasn't true. Their sort of pastor wasn't completely honest with them about that, and it broke her heart. And I told her, someday we're going to burn the note, and it's going to be the real deal, and you're going to be the one to light the match. So I'm excited about that for Miss Elnora and for our church. Absolutely. Very, very exciting time. And then, of course, we want to uh, remind everyone that we sincerely believe with all of our hearts here at VUC see that no one should ever, ever be hungry. So we do a thing we call Nosh. No one stays hungry. Food's available on the way out the door. All you got to do is just stop and pick it up. If you need some or you know someone who does, just stop and pick that up and take it with you. Let's take a deep breath, church. Breathe in the air of the living, loving God who calls us each by name. God, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts. 
grateful for the opportunity to gather and be here this morning with our church family to worship, to learn, to sing, and to seek. God, we come this morning because we believe in you, and we believe in the goodness that is you, and we want to be a part of that goodness. God, we ask you to be present in every song, every note that's played on the instruments, every prayer that's prayed, every word that's spoken. Let everything that happens in this place today point toward you and your goodness and let us be a reflection of you. We ask these things in your wonderful name and all who believed and agreed said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we sing our opening hymn, Oh for a Thousand Tongues. Every week we come together and it's an important part of our service to share the things that are on our minds and in our hearts as we, we think about that together and know that when we leave, we remember those things. Let me start with just a couple. One, of course, we want to remember Miss Elnor. She hasn't been feeling good really for some time. And she called Pam yesterday and said she wouldn't feel like coming to church. We all knew sort of, uh, was it Friday or yesterday? Yesterday. So we all sort of knew that was unusual for Miss Elnor to make that decision on a Saturday. And so this morning, she still is feeling really bad. So Stephen and Pam went to pick her up and they're going to take her over and just get her checked out. So we want to lift her in prayer. We also want or continue to remember Seth Tuska who has some procedures going on and he's some testing and things and so we want to remember Seth as he's in the hospital this morning. James, we're thrilled to see you back after an emergency appendectomy that happened. Uh, I told James it was between he and Rita Swan that was who was the iron people in the congregation that have these surgeries and then come right on to church and and how we want to continue to lift your sister in prayer, James. How's she doing? She's she had a stroke this week, so I remember, remember her. And then I have a couple of unspoken requests that people have shared with me. <clears throat> One is a 
a particular relationship issue and uh, with uh, parents who are co-parenting and um, having some difficulties with, with one of the parents and, and a little bit of a meltdown. So we want to remember that concern uh, and also uh, some medical diagnosis for a family member of mine that's going to be pretty uh, sensitive and pretty important this week that we want to remember her. So other joys and concerns you'd like to share? Jillian. Of course, others. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, I'm driving out to Raleigh, North Carolina, and a friend always gave me a And the concern is, and I'm it's actually my best friend, the concern is I'm praying for him, but he got laid off from his job mm -hmm. before his wedding. So I'm afraid of the Anxious enough, but added to that, huh? Yeah. Any others? Yeah. So your mom's CT crystal? Yeah. yeah. Of course. Any others? Yeah. We, uh, the proper petition for TR's adoption is about to We're excited about that. And prayers for the three new ones that they just got this week. There's one in the nursery and then the two boys. So prayers for you all as you adjust to that and, and for the kids as they adjust as well. Any others? Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. Gracious and loving God, how incredibly blessed we are for this gift of life, even with its ups and downs, its joys and its challenges. God, remind us to always be thankful for life and thankful that you have created each one of us to do something incredibly special in the world. Forgive us when we downplay that, God. When we get so tuned in to ourselves and our own needs and to our ways that we feel insufficient, that we forget that all things are possible through you. God, we pray this morning for those names we have lifted up. We especially pray for our dear Miss Elnora. We pray that you'll be with the doctors and staff at the hospital that they can figure out what's making her feel so bad. Oh, how we love Miss Ornoor. We pray you'd be with Seth as he's undergoing tests and procedures and give him patience and perseverance. It's difficult sometimes to be in hospital environments. 
we pray for Lynn's cousin, Jack, for James's sister, for Crystal's mom, for all those who are undergoing medical diagnosis and treatment and, and in some cases facing diagnosis they didn't see coming. So we pray you give strength and comfort to them. Give them healing of, of their mind and their soul and whatever their physical sense may be. For we know that healing comes in many ways. God, we pray for those that are facing economic challenges, family or friend or even church member relationships. Help us to trust in you and your guidance and your wisdom and how to maneuver through these things. We are so thankful that Kelly and Rebecca are continuing the process of adopting Kiara, for she is already their daughter. So we continue to pray for those legal proceedings. And then for these three new little ones that they have fostered, we, we are thankful for their willingness to open their homes and their hearts and we pray for these sweet kids. And may we in this church welcome them to our family as well and give support and love. God, we're thankful for this church. You have brought us so, so far in seven and a half years. It is humbling to see what we have created and and what we're able to do in our community. And God, we, we pray we'll continue to ask for your vision and not ours and your courage and not ours. Help us be a beacon of light and hope. And God, I know in this church family that there are folks that are having challenges and things on their heart that they didn't want to share for they're much too close to the vest. So just now, we offer up our silent prayers to you. God, in this time together, speak to us, touch us, use us. Give us your hope. As Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting at the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when, when will these things happen? What sign will show that all these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen, but this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. 
Watch out for yourselves. People will hand you over to the councils. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me so that you can testify before them. First, the good news must be proclaimed to all nations. When they haul you in and hand you over, don't worry ahead of time about to say in answer. Instead, say whatever is given to you at the moment. You aren't doing the speaking. The Holy Spirit is. Brothers and sisters will hand each other over to death. A father will turn in his children. Children will rise up against their parents and have them executed. Everyone will hate you because of my name. But whoever stands firm until the end will be saved. There's a story of the moderator of a church council asking for a meeting with the pastor. And the moderator says, I've got good news and bad news, pastor. Pastor says, well, what's the good news? Well, the job description you gave us for your position is so inspiring, we love it. And the bad news is that we formed a search committee to help us fill the position. <laughs> Knock-knock jokes and good news, bad news jokes can give us a quick laugh, and God knows we can use some humor these days. Good news, bad news jokes make me think of the scripture passages like the one we have today. Is there any good news hidden in this? For when we say we're promoting the gospel, the word gospel is interpreted itself as good news. So what we hope is that by sharing the stories of our earliest faith ancestors and their faithfulness and the stories of Jesus and the example he gave us, we will indeed find some good news to hold on to. And yet sometimes scripture stories seem to contain lots of emotion other than good news. Or at least they contain more good news, bad news theology where we can't find good news. And what Lynn just read, I don't know about you friends, but it's sort of tough for me to see what the good news is in that. Today's story gives this picture of Jesus and, and some of his disciples chatting about life. They've been to church. And they've come out of the temple, and as they do, one of the disciples says, uh, Hey, look at these large stones. Look at these great buildings. And let's pause here just a bit and recognize what this meant. It wasn't just a casual observation about the surroundings. Rather, the wording here was meant to portray that the disciples felt that their most sacred place, the temple, and all its surroundings were strong and beyond destruction. It's, just, it's, just, it's as if they were saying, look, Jesus, our church is strong and resistant to outside forces. Look, Jesus, our church is strong and resistant even to inside squabbles and disagreements. Our church is resilient. We are resilient. And then Jesus hears that proclamation of strength and says, You see all these strong buildings and these rocks? Not one will be left. In other words, you are not as resilient as you think. Even the strongest Christian, even the strongest church, has risk of being destroyed from without or within. I've got good news and I've got bad news. Jesus and the disciples make their way to the Mount of Olives, and this isn't the first time that the Bible has Jesus teaching from there. And as they're sitting on the mountain and disciples begin to digest what Jesus has foretold on their walk, indeed, they begin to wonder when all hell would break loose. 
Now remember, church, that during the time of Mark's writing, there was a great divide between Jews and Gentiles, between Jews and Jews, between Gentiles and Gentiles, uh, folks arguing about how to follow Jesus or if to follow Jesus, how to follow God, and how to prove their devotion. And just like today, people were staunchly divided by religion and politics and socioeconomic statuses. So here they are, though, on the mountain, fresh out of church. <laughs> and Peter, James, and John, and Andrew ask Jesus privately, Jesus, just when will this destruction occur? Isn't that an interesting detail that they ask Jesus privately? Did they ask privately because they wanted to be in the know for their own purposes? You know, to prepare themselves, get everything they needed to get before the word got out and others could join in safety and security? Or did they ask privately because they didn't think the crowd could handle the truth? Did they ask privately because as close followers of Jesus, they were afraid to admit their fear and their anxiety and their doubts in public? I don't know. But they asked Jesus privately, and he begins to give more good news. Good news like warnings. People will come and give you a false gospel. They will sound legit. They'll look legit. But what they're saying will not be within the realm of God's vision. And i got to tell you, this statement by Jesus causes me a bit of unrest. Because the truth is, there are a lot of the loudest pulpits or preachers with the largest paychecks that advise people that the good news gospel message of Bluegrass United Church of Christ is false. See, they say that God does not celebrate love no matter the gender of the folks sharing it together. It's the same churches and pastors that we've invited to interfaith worship, but they won't come because they do not believe it's possible to have many paths to the divine. So I know how it feels to be accused of being a wolf in sheep's clothing. Jesus told these guys to be aware of people who are not proclaiming to give a gospel message that does not align with the example of Jesus. And when examined closely, the example of Jesus is one who constantly went against the grain. One who challenged civic authorities. One who consistently welcomed those who had been marginalized or excluded from society. The Jesus, the one who welcomed strangers and tax collectors and prostitutes and women and children and eunuchs to God's beloved family. Jesus warned them and us if we'll listen to ask ourselves if everything we do and say, does it match up with God's vision or with ours? In this private teaching session, Jesus tells them, evaluate, discern if it matches up, and beware if it does not. Jesus continues telling them signs to watch for. More good news. Nations rising against one another. Wars and rumors of wars. Earthquakes and famines. Now, it's no secret this verse has been used by evangelicals, Kenny, to warn their followers that the end is near. And it might happen before they get home. So join the church before you leave. The only thing is, is that these wars between nations and within nations, they've been around from the beginning of time. As have earthquakes and much bigger ones than we've experienced. And famines, well that too since the beginning of time. I wonder what these four guys were thinking and feeling about now this good news they were hearing from Jesus. 
fresh from temple worship. They get this good news from Jesus himself. Temples destroyed, nations and people fighting with one another, folks going hungry to the point of death. Where is the good news, my friends? And then as if we thought it would never come, we read on. Verse 10. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. Ah, Jesus is saying, the good news is up to you. You will have to proclaim the good news in the midst of war and destruction. You will have to rise above the challenges and pushbacks to what you know to be the right way to be and act in the world. All around you will be signs of utter chaos and division. All around you, things will seem hopeless. You may even feel hopeless. And yet the good news must be proclaimed. Not just when you're coming off temple highs, but when you're suffering from worldly lows. I don't know about you, but I'd be wanting some further instruction here. And on point, Jesus gives it. Verse 11. When they bring you to trial and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you're all to say, but say whatever is given you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, Jesus was reminding them that God's presence never leaves and that in times of personal and community despair, God will guide us. God will guide us through the medical diagnosis we didn't see coming. God will be with us through the relationship demise of significant others or family members or church members and friends. God will be with us in the grief and the disappointment. And God will be with us through every challenge of life. Jesus says to them, don't worry. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say and do and be. Yet the problem is, is that, at least for me, all too often we just wing it on our own. In so many ways, we, we try to bull our way through and fix things. Or just the opposite. We just sit and wait for something or someone to change our lives or that of the world. Friends, this scripture makes it pretty clear how the good news of God's love will be known. Evaluate the messages we hear and then having matched them up against the example of Jesus, we move into our lives and the world with hope and healing and love and grace. For whether we see Jesus as Messiah or Jesus as this incredible prophet and rabbi, his example is hard to argue with, isn't it? Of healing and hope, of inclusion and love, of grace and forgiveness, of continuing to try to keep people in relationship and call out for justice in the world. So we have to recognize we can't do this thing called life on our own devices or in our own way. We will run up against the wall every time. But rather, this calls us to prayerful guidance which can give us a clear direction. Jesus said to his disciples that day, I've got bad news. Re really bad news. But I also have really good news. 
things in your life and things in the world are sometimes going to be very challenging and things will seem lost. But you are never alone. And you are never lost and away from God's love and God's presence. It's true what I said to the kids. We can run and hide, lay and hide, hide, but God's always looking for us to come back. Yeah. To come back and touch home base. May we hear God say, I'm it. <laughs> I am that guidance for you and that love for you. It's there. God is there. But the truth is, it's up to us to allow the Holy Spirit to live in and through us. Day by day, hours for the asking. There's an old song that I'm sure Kenny knows, probably many of you know. It came to my mind even this morning as I was reviewing the sermon. And it was something like, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon God's word. Good news. Good news indeed. We come to the communion table each week to remind us to depend on God's word, and God's promise, to remind us of that life of Jesus, the rabbi and prophet who taught us how to live in love. We get weary and we know that nations are rising against nations, families against families. Folks are going hungry, folks in despair and challenge. This table reminds us that God is always there. Let us sing that faith. Let's pray. God, it is at this table where all of us find a welcome and remind us over and over again that you love none of us more or less than the other. We are all your beloved children. And however we got here this morning, you welcome us. You welcome us with your love and your hope and with your assurance that you're always with us. We're reminded of the life of Jesus, 
and all the lessons that he taught us while he was here. We're reminded of his life and his courage, his inclusion, his love, and that is an example that we seek to follow in some way. But it's hard sometimes, God. It's hard when the worries of the world or the worries of our own lives get us bogged down. So we ask that you take this crumb of bread and this sip of juice. And somehow as we take that in, let us take in your presence in a very real way. We're reminded of the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I remember Herm Heisey. Some of you remember dear Herm. He was an elder here and retired Methodist minister who taught me as a minister to break a lot of rules. <laughs> he had a prison ministry and later after he retired for many years, he was befriending some guys at prison and I said, Herm, how do you get in there around visiting hours? He said, oh, I just play my clergy card. <laughs> Herm's the one that I would hear say the Lord's Prayer. And the reason I share this story with you about Herm is it's a funny how you remember things. And he was the one that would say, And thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever. I used to always just end it at forever. So I asked Herm one time, Well, why do you say forever and ever? He said, I just need that reminder that it's not just forever. It's forever and ever and ever that God's with us. I think those folks gathered in the room with Jesus on the last night he'd be with them probably need to hear that forever and ever and ever. They were pretty scared. The world had gone crazy. They were being hunted down for even following. And so Jesus gathered with them and scholars think that women and children were right there. They were all in fear. And he took a loaf of bread as they began their supper together gave thanks and he blessed the bread and then he broke it and he said look I've lived my life for you and now I'm going to lose my life you know they tried to tell Jesus to be quiet and to stop welcoming folks and giving this radical hospitality but he kept on keeping on after supper, as was his Jewish custom, he took a cup. He blessed the cup. He said, this cup's a sign of my new promise with you. I'm going to be leaving you physically. But I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to stay with you. When things get tough, you remember my spirit lives on. This morning, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, this may be the first time you've taken communion or at least been in a church that said it was okay to do so. See, we don't really believe in any rules for communion. You know why? I read all four gospel accounts of that story. And Jesus didn't give one rule. He said to everybody in there, we knew there were doubters. We knew there were betrayers. We knew there were folks fearful. We knew there were folks there steadfast in their faith. We knew there were women and children, believers and non-believers. And he said, look, here's all I ask. Every time you eat and drink, remember my life and do your best to follow it. 
this morning you're invited to take a piece of bread and then after a time of meditation to drink from the cup. May you feel God's presence as you do. So keep shopping at Kroger. I share with you our, our quarterly check that we get from just us shopping at Kroger and connecting our account to Bluegrass. So we have another check for $338.13, all of which will be for our outreach. So thank you for shopping at Kroger. And again, on the way in today, someone handed me the first envelope I've received other than Belinda's uh, for the church. I have no idea what's in, but I'm going to put that right there, and then James will keep us abreast that we can continue to put in the gold bricks up there as we pray about that and continue to support the church. It is a part of our continued worship. Let us pray. <coughs> Holy God, we thank you for the vision for the things that this church wants to accomplish in the community. So we ask that you be with us in our planning and in all that we do and that we will measure ourselves against false teachings and in ways that are contrary to what your vision of the world is. Help us in everything we do and say as a church and as individuals to measure ourselves against your call for our life. And so now as we give, however we give, some of us give our, our time and our energy and our creativity and our gifts and talents, and some of us give resources. However we give, oh God, we just ask that it all be used for your glory, for your witness, and indeed to give good news to the world. Amen.
as we sing our closing hymn, I Would Be True, maybe you've been thinking about joining our church family. If you'd like to do that, I would welcome you to the front as we sing together. Let's sing together, I Would Be True. friends sometimes we expect God to come in lightning bolts but I love the line of that song I would be tuned to hear God's slightest whisper and then the line I would look up and laugh and love and live may it be so amen amen Thank you. 